Wish, written by Barbara O'Connor. Chapter 1. I looked down at the paper on my desk, the getting to know you paper. At the top, Mrs. Willoughby had written Charlemagne Reese. I put a big X over Charlemagne and wrote Charlie. My name is Charlie. Charlemagne is a dumb name for a girl, and I have told my mama about a gazillion times. I looked around me at the hillbilly kids doing math in their workbooks. My best friend, Alvina, told me they would be hillbilly kids. You will hate it in Colby, she said. There's just red dirt roads and hillbilly kids there. She had flipped her silky hair over her shoulder and added, I bet they eat squirrels. I glanced at the lunch boxes under the desks around me and wondered if there were any squirrel sandwiches in them. I looked down at the paper in front of me. I was supposed to fill in all this stuff so my new teacher would get to know me. On the line beside, describe your family, I wrote, bad. What is your favorite subject in school? None. List three of your favorite activities, soccer, ballet, and fighting. Two of those favorite activities were lies, but one of them was the truth. I am fond of fighting. My sister Jackie inherited daddy's inky black hair and I inherited his fiery red temper. If I had a nickel for every time I'd heard, the apple don't fall far from the tree, I'd be rich. Daddy fights so much that everybody calls him scrappy. In fact, at this very minute, while I'm stuck here in Colby, North Carolina, surrounded by hillbilly kids, old Scrappy is back in Raleigh in the county jail again because of his fondness for fighting. And I don't need a crystal ball to know that at this very minute, in our house in Raleigh, smack dab in the middle of the day, Mama is in bed with the curtains drawn and empty soda cans on the nightstand. She will stay in the bed the live long day. If I was there, she wouldn't care one little bit if I went to school or stayed on the couch watching TV and eating cookies for lunch. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, that social services lady said when she started rattling off a list of reasons why I was getting shipped off to this sorry excuse for a town to live with two people I didn't even know. It's better to stay with kin, she told me. Gus and Bertha are kin. What kind of kin, I asked. She explained how Bertha is Mama's sister and Gus is her husband. She said they didn't have any kids and they were happy to take me in. Then how come Jackie gets to stay with Carol Lee? I asked about a million times. Carol Lee is Jackie's best friend. She lives in a fancy brick house with a swimming pool. Her mama gets out of bed every morning and her daddy is not called Scrappy. So that lady told me again how Jackie was practically a grown up and would be graduating from high school in a couple of months. When I pointed out that I was in fifth grade and not exactly a baby, she sighed and smiled a fake smile and said, Charlie, you have to live with Gus and Bertha for a while. I never laid eyes on those people and now I'm supposed to live with them? When I asked how long I had to be there, she said until things settled down and Mama got her feet on the ground. Well, how hard is it to put your dang feet on the ground? Is what I thought about that. You need a stable family environment, she told me. But I knew what she really meant was, you need a family that's not all broken like yours is. Still, I whined and argued and whined and argued. But here I am, in Colby, North Carolina, staring down at this getting to know you paper. Have you finished, Charlemagne? Mrs. Willoughby was suddenly beside me. My name is Charlie, I said. And a greasy-haired boy in the front of the class let out a sputtering laugh. I sent one of my famous glares his way till he hushed up and turned red. I handed Mrs. Willoughby that paper and watched her eyes dart back and forth as she read it. Her neck got splotchy red and the corners of her mouth twitched. She didn't even look at me before she marched back up to the front of the room and dropped that paper on her desk like it was a hot potato. I slumped down in my seat and wiped my sweaty palms on my shorts. It was only April, but it was already hot as blazes. You want me to help you with that? The boy in front of me pointed at the math worksheet on my desk. He had red hair and wore ugly black glasses. No, I said. He shrugged, took a pencil out of his desk, and headed to the pencil sharpener. Up, down, up, down. That's how he walked. Like one leg was shorter than the other. And he dragged one foot along the floor, so his sneaker made squeaking noises. I glanced at the clock. Dang it! I had missed 11-11. I have a list of all the ways there are to make a wish, like seeing a white horse or blowing a dandelion. 
looking at the clock at exactly 1111 is on my list. I learned that from some old man who owned the bait and tackle shop out by the lake where Scrappy and I used to go fishing. Now that I'd missed 1111, I was going to have to find another way to get in my wish for the day. I hadn't missed one single day of making my wish since the end of fourth grade, so I sure didn't want to miss one now. Then Mrs. Willoughby nodded toward the red-headed boy sharpening his pencil and said, Howard, why don't you be Charlie's backpack buddy for a while? Mrs. Willoughby explained that when a new kid comes to school, their backpack buddy shows them around and tells them the rules till they get settled. Howard grinned and said, yes ma'am, and that was that. I had a backpack buddy whether I wanted one or not. The rest of the afternoon creeped along so slow I could hardly stand it. I stared out the window while other kids took turns bragging about their social studies projects. A misty rain had begun to fall and dark gray clouds hovered over the tops of the mountains in the distance. When the bell finally rang, I hightailed it out of there and headed for the bus. I hurried up the aisle and dropped into the last row. I kept my eyes on a piece of dried up chewing gum that stuck to the seat in front of me while I set out laser thoughts zipping and zapping around the bus. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. If I had to be stuck on a bus full of kids I didn't even know, I wanted to at least sit by myself. My laser thoughts seemed to be working, so I took my eyes off the gum and glanced out the window. The redhead boy with the up and down walk was hurrying toward the bus, his backpack bouncing against him every step. When he got on the bus, I quickly looked back at the gum and sent my laser thoughts out again. But that boy didn't waste a minute shuffling up the aisle and plopping himself right down next to me. Then he thrust his hand out at me and said, Hey, I'm Howard Odom. He pushed at his ugly black glasses and added, Your backpack buddy. Now, what kind of kid shakes hands like that? No kid I ever knew. He kept his hand there and stared down at me until I couldn't help myself. I shook hands with him. Charlie Reese, I said. Where are you from? Raleigh. Where, why are you here? He sure was nosy, but I figured if I'd laid out the cold hard truth that would shut him up and maybe he wouldn't want to be my backpack buddy anymore. My daddy's in jail and my mama won't get out of bed, I said. Well, that boy didn't even blink an eye. What's he in jail for? Fighting. Why? What do you mean? He wiped at his foggy up, fogged up glasses with the bottom of his t-shirt. His face was flushed pink in the damp heat of the bus. Why was he fighting, he said. I shrugged. There was no telling why Scrappy was fighting. Besides, there were probably a bunch of other reasons he was in jail, but nobody ever tells me anything. Gus and Bertha told my mama you were coming. They go to my church and I gave them a cat one time, Howard said. A scrawny gray cat that was living up under my porch. Then he went on and on about how Gus taught him how to make a slingshot and how sometimes Bertha sells bread and butter pickles by the side of the road in the summer. How his mama drove her car right into the ditch beside Gus and Bertha's driveway one time and Gus pulled it out with the tractor and then they all ate barbecue sandwiches in the front yard. You'll like living with them, he said. I'm not living with them, I told him. I'm going back to Raleigh. Oh. He looked down at his freckled hands in his lap. When? When my mama gets her feet on the ground. How long does that take? I shrugged. Not long. But the knot of my stomach told me that was a lie. The worry clutching at my heart told me my mama might never get her feet on the ground. As the bus pulled out of the parking lot and headed toward town, Howard rattled off a list of school bus rules. No saving seats. No gum. No riding on the back of the seats. No cussing. A whole mess of rules that I was pretty sure nobody paid any mind to except maybe Howard. I looked out the window at the sorry sights of Colby. A gas station. A trailer park. A laundromat. Wasn't much of a town if you ask me. No malls or movie theaters. Not even a Chinese restaurant. Before long, the bus was making its way up the mountain. The rain had stopped and wavy plumes of steam drifted up off the asphalt. The narrow road curved back and forth and round and round. Every now and then, the bus stopped to let some kid off at a pitiful looking house with a red dirt yard. We were almost to Gus and Bertha's when the bus stopped and Howard said, see ya. Another younger looking redheaded boy got off with him. I watched them make their way across the weed field yard to their house. Bikes and skateboards and footballs and sneakers were scattered from the front door to the road. A garden hose snaked from a dripping faucet to a hole in the yard. 
A small, dirty-faced boy was dropping rocks into the hole, sending up splashes of muddy water. Howard waved as the bus pulled away, but I turned my eyes back to that dried-up gum. When we finally got to guess and Bertha's long gravel driveway, I got off and watched the bus drive away, making the rain-soaked Queen Anne's lace bob at the edge of the road. I, I was starting up the driveway when I noticed something shiny in the dirt at the edge of the road. A penny! I darted over and picked it up. Then I hurled it as far as I could and made my wish quick before that penny hit the road and bounced into the woods. There, I'd gotten my wish for the day. Maybe this time it would finally come true. Chapter 2 I trudged up the long driveway, jumping over puddles of muddy rainwater and wondering what Jackie was doing right that very minute. Probably smoking cigarettes with some boy in the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly across from the high school. Everybody thinks my sister is an angel straight down from heaven, but I know better. When Gus and Bertha's house finally came into view, I stopped. I'd been there four days already, but I still couldn't get over how that house hung off the side of the mountain like it did. The front of the house was smack on the ground with flowering shrubs nestled right up against it, but the back was on stilts stuck into the steep mountainside. On top of the stilts was a tiny porch with two rocking chairs and window boxes full of flowers perched on the railing. On my first night in Colby, Gus had dragged a kitchen chair out there for me after supper. Bertha had asked me about a million questions, like what was my favorite subject in school, and did I have a lucky number? Did I want to go swimming at the Y sometime, and did I like boiled peanuts? But I just mumbled and shrugged till she finally stopped. I was too mad to talk. What was I doing there on that porch with these people I didn't even know? I felt like I'd been tossed out on the side of the road like a sack of unwanted kittens. So the three of us sat in silence, watching the sun sink behind the mountain and the lightning bugs twinkle off and on among the pine trees. I'd spent the next three days trying to convince Gus and Bertha that it was dumb for me to go to school since it was almost summer. But the next thing I knew, I was sitting on that bus full of hillbilly kids on my way to school. Hey there, Bertha called from the front door as I made my way across the yard. A fat orange cat darted out from behind the garden shed and trotted along beside me. Gus and Bertha had a whole tassel of cats sleeping under the porch, sunning on the windowsills, swatting bees out in the garden. I went inside and dropped my backpack on Gus's tattered easy chair. The smell of warm cinnamon drifted through the kitchen door. I made coffee cake, Bertha said. I wonder why they call it coffee cake. Not a drop of coffee in it. She held the door open for the cat to come in. Oh, I know. I bet, because you're supposed to drink coffee when you eat it. You think? Well, anyways, who cares, right? It had been clear to me from day one that Bertha was a talker. Not like her sister, my mama, who went for days without saying a word. I had been surprised when I saw how much they looked alike, though. Same mousy brown hair, same long, thin fingers, even the same crinkly lines along the sides of their mouths. I sat at the kitchen table and watched Bertha cut a thick slice of coffee cake and put it on the paper towel in front of me. Then she pulled her chair close to mine and said, Tell me everything about your first day, your teacher, the other kids, what your classroom looks like, what you had for lunch, what you did at recess, every little thing. Some girl ate a squirrel sandwich, I said. Bertha's eyebrows shot up. A squirrel sandwich? Are you sure? I licked my finger and pressed it on the paper towel to get the coffee cake crumbs. I nodded, but I didn't look at her when I said I'm sure. A small gray cat sat on the kitchen counter grooming himself. I wondered if that was one Howard had given them. Bertha picked up and kissed the top of his head. Charlie, don't want cat hair in her coffee cake, Walter. Then she gently put him down on the linoleum floor. His tail twitched as he walked a line of tiny ants marching from under the sink to a dark spot of something sticky by the stove. And there's an up-down boy in my class, I said. Bertha cocked her head. What in the name of Bessie McGee is an up-down boy? She snapped a round leaf off a plant on the windowsill and tucked it into her pocket. This boy named Howard who walks up and down like this. I walk like Howard around the kitchen table. Howard Odom, Bertha said. Bless his heart. Good as gold, that boy is. Don't bat an eye when kids poke fun at him, calling him names like Pogo. She shook her head. I swear, kids can be so mean sometimes. Pogo? Yeah, you know, like a pogo stick. 
He ought to punch their lights out, I said. That's what I'd do. Bertha widened her eyes at me, then shook her head. Not that boy. He wouldn't hurt a fly. All them Odoms are like that. Good-hearted. Kind of wild sometimes, those brothers of his, but good-hearted. She brushed crumbs off the table and tossed them into the sink. Shoot, just last week, three of those boys were helping over here. Guess replaced some boards on the porch and they got when they got eaten up by the termites, and they wouldn't take one penny. We sent them home with a burlap bag full of turnips, and they were happy as clams. Turnips? Any kids who are happy about a bag of turnips must be weird if you ask me. Bertha sat at the table beside me again. So what else, she said. Tell me something else about school. I shrugged. I wasn't going to tell her about that getting to know you paper dropped onto Mrs. Willoughby's desk like a hot potato or about Howard being my backpack buddy. So I just said, nothing. Nothing? Nope. Bertha slapped her hand on the kitchen table. I almost forgot, she said. I got you something. She motioned for me to follow her down the hall to the tiny spare room where I'd been sleeping. Ta-da! She flung her arm out and grinned. I followed her gaze to the narrow bed in the corner. Propped up against the wall were two pillows in pink pillowcases with Cinderella on them. I realized this morning that this room don't look one bit like a little girl's room, Bertha said. So I went down to Big Lots and got those pillowcases. I was going to get the matching bedspread, but it was a double and not a twin. I might go back and get this fluffy pink rug they have if I can get guests to help me move that bureau. And I know I need to get my canning jars out of here, and that old TV don't even work anymore, but... She rambled on and on, but I didn't even listen. Cinderella pillowcases? She must think I'm five instead of almost 11. She sure didn't know much about kids. That afternoon, Jackie called from Raleigh. She told me how Carol Lee's cousin came to visit and gave her a cashmere sweater she didn't want anymore. And Carol Lee's daddy was teaching her how to drive since Scrappy never would. She said she was thinking about putting blue streaks in her hair and that some boy named Arlo was taking her to a NASCAR race down in Charlotte. She was so busy telling me about her happy life that she didn't even ask me what it was like living in Colby with hillbilly kids who eat squirrel. After we hung up, I went back to my room and laid on the Cinderella pillows and felt sorry for myself. How could Jackie be so happy? It seemed like she didn't care one little bit about me anymore. I bet Scrappy didn't care about me e anymore either. I bet he was so busy playing basketball behind the tall fence at the county jail that he didn't even think about me up here on the mountain in a house full of cats with these people I don't even know. And I knew for sure my mama wasn't thinking about me as she shuffled around the house in her bathrobe, all red-eyed and stoop-shouldered. I was definitely going to have to go out on that porch tonight and wait for the first star to come out so I could make my wish again. Maybe two in one day would do the trick. Chapter 3 That night, out on the back porch with Gus and Bertha, I saw the first star twinkling over the treetops. I closed my eyes and wished like crazy. Making a wish? Gus asked. I felt myself blush. No. Bertha nudged Gus. Tell her about the time you wished your Uncle Dean would disappear, and then he did, she said. Gus flapped his hand at her. Ah, now, Bertie, she don't want to hear that boring old story. He rocked his chair, making the porch floor creak and groan. While Bertha talked a blue streak and hardly ever sat still, Gus was quiet and easygoing. With a calm, slow way about him, he wore a baseball cap all day and half the night, his scraggly brown hair poking out from under it in every way. The bill of his cap was dark brown with dirt and greasy fingerprints. That there is Pegasus, he said, pointing to a cluster of stars hovering way up over the top of the mountains in the distance. Gus should have been a scientist, Bertha said. He can tell you everything you ever wanted to know about stars and air and plants and water and weather and all that stuff. Gus let out a little pfft. He thinks I married him for his looks, Bertha winked at me. But I married him for his brains, she said. Gus laughed. And then the most amazing thing happened. They both reached out at the exact same time and held hands. It was like somebody had said, okay, on the count of three, hold hands. I'd never in my life seen Scrappy and Mama hold hands. Shoot, most of the time they didn't even look at each other. I watched Gus and Bertha sitting there, gazing at the night sky, the corners of their mouths turned up into contented smiles. Every now and then, Bertha looked dreamily over at Gus, like he was a movie star and not some scraggly-haired man who worked in a mattress factory over in Cooperville. 
We stayed out there till it started to sprinkle again, a soft, cold rain that sent the cats at our feet darting inside. I went to bed that night with my head swirling. I thought about Scrappy snoring away in the county jail and Mama staring up at the ceiling of her dark bedroom. I thought about Jackie whispering gossip and painting her toenails with Carol Lee. I thought about Howard Odom with his up-down walk and his good-hearted family, and I thought about Gus and Bertha holding hands under the glow of Pegasus, and then I thought about my own pitiful self laying there wondering if my wish would ever come true. The next day, I wore Jackie's old white majorette boots to school. I knew I'd made a mistake the minute I got on the bus. As I made my way down the aisle, some of those girls pointed at my boots, giggling and whispering. I felt my face burn, and I glared at them. Howard motioned for me to sit next to him, but I flopped down in the seat behind him. I spent the morning drawing on my arm with a blue marker and pretending to read. At recess, Howard tried and tried to get me to let him show me around the school. I'm your backpack buddy, remember? He said. I shook my head. Forget it, I said. I'm not really interested. Besides, I'm not going to be here much longer. Why not? I rolled my eyes. I told you I'm going back to Raleigh. But what if your mama don't get her feet on the ground, he said. Well, what the heck kind of question was that? I stomped away from him and plopped down under the cafeteria windows and glared at the kids playing soccer on the playground. Once or twice, I glanced over at Howard. He was drawing circles in the dirt with his foot and looking all mopey. When the bell rang, everybody scrambled to line up. A bunch of wild boys pushed and shoved their way in front of Howard, and he didn't even say anything. As I headed toward the line, a girl from my class named Audrey Mitchell waltzed right up to me and said, Nice boots! She smirked while her friends giggled behind her. I felt Scrappy's temper working its way up from the tip of my toes to the top of my head. Hot as fire! Then I said, Thanks! They're good for kicking! And I kicked her skinny shin. Hard! The next few minutes were a blur of crying and hollering and tattling, and then I found myself sitting in front of Mr. Mason, the principal. While he lectured about my inappropriate behavior, I studied the inky little stars and hearts I had drawn on my arm that morning. Mr. Mason asked me if I knew that what I did was wrong and would I like if somebody did that to me and a bunch of other questions I didn't even care about. I said yes sir and no sir, but I kept my eyes on my inky arm and clunked the heels of those majorette boots against the legs of the chair. I shrugged when he said he was going to have to call Bertha and tell her what I had done. Then I went back to my class and I said I was sorry to Audrey Mitchell, even though I wasn't really, and that was how my second day of school went in Colby. That afternoon on the bus, Howard ignored my laser thoughts again and made a beeline right for me. He dropped into the seat next to me. You should save me a seat, because I think backpack buddies are supposed to sit together, he said. That's against the rules, I said. I'm pretty sure you can save a seat for a backpack buddy. I rolled my eyes and looked out the window. Why'd you kick Audrey Mitchell? Howard asked. I told him about how she had said nice boots with that smirk on her face. He shook his head and said, Dang, Charlie, why you gotta get so mad about that? That ain't nothing. I shot him a glare. Maybe it was nothing to him, but it was something to me. I almost told him about my fiery temper when I got from Scrappy, but I didn't. Instead, I told him about how I got sent home from kindergarten the very first day for poking some boy with a pencil. Eraser end or pointy end? Howard asked. Pointy. Dang, Charlie. I shrugged. I know. But I was mad. About what? He stuck his thumb right through my sandwich, I said. Howard shook his head again, making his red hair flop down over his glasses. Here's what you do from now on, he said. Every time you feel yourself starting to get mad, say, pineapple. Pineapple? Yeah. Why? That'll be like a code word to remind yourself to simmer down. Mama taught my little brother Cotton to say rutabaga every time he gets the urge to draw on the wall. Does it work? Sometimes. That sounded like the dumbest thing I'd ever heard, but I didn't say so. We sat in silence as the bus made its way up the narrow mountain road. Every once in a while, the view out the window changed from woods, thick and pine trees and ferns and moss-covered rocks, to a wide open view of the mountains stretching on forever in the distance. A smoky haze hovered over them, soft gray, against the deep blue of the mountains. That's why they're called the Blue Ridge Mountains, Gus had told me the first day I got to Colby, because they're blue. Then he had gone on to explain how the color was because of something the pine trees released into the air. 
I didn't know what the heck he was talking about, but I nodded like I did. When the bus got to Howard's house, he grabbed his backpack and said, Remember, pineapple. I watched him and his brother go up the rickety steps of their front porch and disappear inside the house, letting the screen door slam with a bang behind them. Next to the front door was a ratty-looking couch covered with a bedspread. Wilted yellowing plants and dried up flowers planted in coffee cans lined the edges of the porch. Maybe the Odom's hearts were so good that they didn't care that they lived in such a sad-looking house. The bus chugged and groaned up the winding road. I was thinking about what I was going to say to Bertha about my kicking incident when a commotion outside the window caught my eye. Two dogs were fighting in a dirt driveway beside a cluster of trailers. One was small and black, the other one was brown and black and skinny as all get out. A little girl was screaming and carrying on while an old man turned on a garden hose and aimed a hard spray of water at the skinny dog. Get out of here, he hollered. A woman came running out of one of the trailers and tried to grab the black dog while the skinny dog snapped and growled and then suddenly took off running. He ran along the edge of the road beside the bus for a minute or two, his long ears flapping in the breeze. I pressed my face against the window and watched him lope along the side of the road and then turn and disappear into the woods. When I got off at Gus and Bertha's a few minutes later, I looked down at those majorette boots. Jackie had always looked so pretty in them, but I looked dumb. Those girls were right to laugh at me. That familiar mad feeling was settling over me like a blanket. But this time, I was feeling mad at myself for being a loser that nobody wanted. I stomped my foot and then I kicked at gravel, sending it tumbling into the rhododendron bushes along the side of the driveway. Then I whispered, pineapple, before heading up onto Gus and Bertha's. Chapter 4 I figured Bertha was going to be mad at me for kicking that girl, but she surprised me by putting her arm around me and saying, tomorrow's a new day. Then she gave me a little squeeze and added, Personally, I love those boots. She didn't say one word about my inappropriate behavior. Mama would have hollered at me and reminded me for the umpteenth time that I was a troublemaker like Scrappy. After supper that day, we had blueberry pie for dessert, and I got to make my wish. If you cut off the pointed end of a slice of pie and save it for last, you can make a wish when you eat it. I had learned that from my cousin Melvin, who swore it had worked for him when his brother ran off and got married and left him with the bedroom all to himself. I knew Gus and Bertha were watching me cut off that pointed piece and push it to the edge of my plate, but they didn't say anything. Even Bertha had been kind of quiet during supper. Maybe she really was mad at me for kicking Audrey. Maybe she was thinking, the apple don't fall far from the tree. Maybe that night in bed, she and Gus would whisper to each other about how much I am like Scrappy and what in the world had they gotten themselves into when they agreed to let me stay with them. After I ate that little pointed piece of pie and made my wish, I went out to the front porch to watch Gus do some weeding in the vegetable garden. A fluffy black cat rubbed against my legs, purring up a storm. I wrote my name in the dirt with a stick and then scribbled it out. There wasn't one blade of grass in that yard, just dirt and rocks with sprinkles of color here and there. Patches of wildflowers nestled around the clothesline posts. The pink blossoms of dogwood tree over by the driveway. A neat row of daffodils lined up like soldiers along the edge of the chicken wire fence that surrounded the garden. Gus whistled while he hoed around the tiny tomato plants, stepping carefully between the pole beans and zucchini that were just beginning to poke through the warm spring dirt. On my very first day in Colby, Bertha had said to Gus, let's take Charlie on a tour of the garden. So I had followed along behind them while they pointed out each little plant, telling me how the pole beans were going to climb up the twine and the zucchini would have giant yellow flowers. I had nodded and said, oh, because what else would you say about a vegetable in a garden? But Gus, you would have thought that was the Garden of Eden out there the way he took care of it, examining each new leaf on the okra plants or moving a squash vine off the walking path. So while I scribbled in the red dirt, Gus whistled and hoed. Every now and then, he tugged on the bill of his cap or swatted at mosquitoes. I could hear Bertha in the kitchen talking to some of the cats while she fed them, scolding one of them for killing a bird, telling another he was getting too fat. I was about to go on back inside when something caught my eye. There was movement behind the tangle of shrubs that separated the yard from the woods. The black cat darted off, disappearing behind the shed over by the garden. I stood real still and squinted into the darkness of the woods. All of the sudden... A dog poked its head out from behind bushes. 
a skinny brown and black dog with floppy ears, the same dog I'd seen fighting that afternoon. He looked at me and cocked his head. I took one slow, tiptoeing step toward him. He ducked his head back a little, watching me. I took another step, and quick as lightning, he ran off into the woods. Dang it, I said. You say something? Gus called from the garden. There was a dog over there, I pointed to the bushes. Brown and black, floppy ears. Yeah, I said. Did you see him? No, but I've seen him plenty of times before. Who does he belong to? Gus propped the hoe against the fence and sat in the lawn chair in the yard. Just an old wild stray, he said. Been hanging around here for months. Bertha keeps putting table scraps out for him. He don't mind eating her meatloaf, and he don't want nothing else to do with her. I looked toward the woods. I bet I can catch him, I said. Gus took off his baseball cap and scratched his head. That old mutt is mighty skittish. If I can catch him, can I keep him? I think that dog would rather be a stray, he said. But I knew better. I knew what it felt like to be a stray, not having a home where somebody wanted you. And he was a fighter, like me. That dog and I had a lot in common. I was suddenly overwhelmed with love for that skinny dog. I made a solemn vow and promised to myself right then and there, that dog was going to be mine.